first of all, I'll just make point. I have no idea what those images mean, but they are images <laughs> taken from a prospectus which was used to raise uh, $5 million in equity financing for an exploration campaign to look, at, um, to look for uranium. And apparently these pictures look very similar to the pictures you get from very large uranium deposits uh, in South Australia. The other thing to notice about this, if you can just see these little black dots, the little black dots are, are sampling undertaken by the Geological Survey here in Western Australia. And what these guys have done is they have taken some basic geoscience that has been put, put out by the government, combined that with their own skill to go and do um, some exploration activity. And we're going to come back to um, those guys in a minute. Now, what are we really talking about? We're talking about digging holes out in uh, the dirt. Uh, WA is a good place to dig holes. You tend to find um, minerals here. And we're talking about whether or not there is any problem in why industry alone might not dig the uh, correct amount of holes or the optimal number of holes from uh, society's point of view. So why would the government be at all interested in um, this idea of how much exploration is undertaken? So there's a couple of um, reasons that the government might be interested in this, or at least reasons why we might think that the government could get involved in this space. They have two types of interventions. One is the provision of basic, what they will call pre-competitive uh, geoscience. This is basic information. There's a long history of this kind of um, support, geological survey work. Uh, and the other kind of activity that governments in Australia get involved in is the direct payments to exploration firms. So South Australia, the Northern Territory and Western Australia all do this uh, and uh, the other places don't have huge mineral resources. So some of the big places where mining takes place, there is this activity that seems a bit strange at first of why would the government be giving direct payments to exploration companies. Now, the, the first one, the pre-competitive geoscience, that's um, got some, some solid background and that's been around for a long time. So we have this idea, if you undertake some exploration activity, what we find is that uh, you have to make an announcement to the ASX as soon as you make a significant find, everyone pegs the area next to you. And so going back for a long time in history, there's this well-recognised phenomena where people engaged in exploration can't capture all the benefits from that exploration. Okay? You only peg a certain amount of the space. So there's this, because you only capture a fraction of the benefits of your exploration activity, you underinvest in exploration. And that's pretty well established. You can also see, and this will come up in, in some slides I bring, um, oh, I'll show you in a, in a little minute, uh, this basic information has these um, public good properties that different mining companies can all use this. It's non-rival in consumption. And you can be looking for different things. So you can have a whole sequence of um, exploration companies looking for gold, a whole sequence of exploration companies looking for something else using the same basic information. So it has this um, non-rival consumption attribute. And I would draw on something that is maybe a bit tangential, but I think is valuable in that Geoscience and the government involvement in this has um, contributed to wealth creation and demonstrated the value of science. So you can go right back in time into, into the US, the emergence of the geological survey in the US, how this enabled the nation, a, a young nation at that stage, to exploit these resources. And it really projected out the benefits of science. It made it tractable to people. And I, I genuinely think that that's an important issue. The last one is something that no one else is, uh, that I can work out has talked about, and it's particular into the way that financing for exploration takes place, who, takes, who undertakes the exploration, uh, and how they raise the money for that exploration. And it's a market for lemons problem. So I'm going to highlight a bit about that as well. So the first thing, so that's, that's kind of the theory about why governments might want to get involved in this space. How does it work in practice? So I've got these two mechanisms, I think, how they work in practice. We're in WA, we've got three things. We've got ore, gold, and nickel. Basically, that's it, right? There's a lot of other stuff that counts for 2% of nothing. Right, this is the, what, what, what's happened there? Uh, okay, so this is basically the landscape of mining in this state on the end. We either have small, medium, or large, because it's easy, 
to characterize things this, this way of three different minerals. Right? That's what you're going to find. Important to note, large in Western Australia means very large. What we call medium, literally if you, if you go through and you index what people are calling large, you go, that's not a large mine, that's a medium mine. Right? So we have, large here is big and that's, that's important because while they're very low probability events that you find these things, if you find stuff here, it's worth a lot of money. So what I've got here, the, the state government packages up all of the activities it does, its sort of geological survey function, these drilling subsidies, its information distribution system, all of those things, its library, and calls it, you know, it's the exploration incentive package. And really what I think it does is if you're an explorer, what this information that they provide or these services that they provide, what they really do is they decrease they give you greater information, greater certainty about where to drill, and they effectively decrease the number of metres that you have to drill before you find something. Right? And some of those things that you will find, will, you'll be able to do some more work, prove them up into a discovery, and you'll go on to have an operational mine. So what I think you're effectively doing here with this basic geoscience, um, looking at my, my decision firm here, if I'm going to undertake a drilling campaign, I'm going to undertake that drilling campaign if the expected value of that um, campaign is positive and you're influencing that by decreasing the cost of finding these deposits. So if I'm a firm, I think that there's a real tractable, tractable pathway from the activities that the government undertakes to how I run my business. All right, so that's my first pathway. That's the traditional pathway that has supported geoscience spending for uh, many, many decades. There's another um, way, this market for lemons problem. So market for lemons, what, what do we have? Now, what I want to point out is, here's my embedded file, here's my link to the YouTube file, neither of which are now working in here. But I have a third option, uh, because we had uh, a little bit of time. So if this works, okay, and now I can just run this. And click on this and put the microphone here. Because wherever you see used car dealer, think uh, exploration company proponent. Okay, so hopefully that uh, little illustration has reminded everyone what the market for lemons <coughs> problem is. 
And now how we can see how this might be related to uh, ex raising funds for exploration activity. It's expensive to put together a portfolio of good prospects. It's much cheaper to put forward a portfolio of prospects to market to raise funds for dodgy stuff. All right? And so what we have is we have a market for lemons problem in the, in the market for equity capital. And now I'm not sure why we're not moving. Okay. So does that make sense? So if we want, what we're going to expect to see here is that if there's a market for lemons problem, we're going to be looking for things like third party certification. Third party certification can work to allow you to raise the equity capital. Without mechanisms like third party certification or appeals to experts or association with reputation, the market for equity capital for exploration companies collapses to zero. And if you go out there and you uh, actively look at, the, look at the way companies market their stuff, look at what happens in this space, you see exactly these activities, associations with experts uh, and looking for third party certification. So, Oh, they'll be made because if you want to, because that's how you get you. There's no debt finance in this business. If you want to go for, if you want to engage in exploration, the only way you can raise money is equity capital. And I'll make, I'll make that. that, that I'll, I'll, I've got an illustrative example of how all that works. So here, here's here are the two mechanisms that we've going, got going on. I've got um, your enterprise uranium up the top here. Um, the guys that took this basic uh, geoscience data. Uh, combined it with their skill, successfully able to go out there and market uh, these prospects. These, these guys have got long-term investors going off. So that's the traditional approach. And here is an extract from what comes out in the, in the uh, releases on the stock exchange from a company that's got co-drilling. You can look at all of the language that they're doing there. They're saying, in effect, that the government is giving me third-party certification. All right, they're out there saying, I've been assessed by an expert panel of the government. I must be a good prospect. You can trust me when I come and get equity capital from you. So what I've got now is I want to go through a story with you about that goes through all of this and illustrates all of these points that shows a lot of money is at stake it here. And then I'll go, get on to the results of my paper. But this gives you the story of why I think that this is actually true got a case study that tells you how you can get these sort of results. All right, here's my uh, Penny Dreadful Sirius uh, 2009. Uh, it's just working through its listing requirements. On here, it's putting in a new board. It's doing a bunch of things. It's making some announcements about what's going on, saying it has $7 million in the bank. All right, we move forward a little bit from all of this. They, they burn through that money. We've got to raise some more money. And this is actually how you raise money. Look at this. We've got 1.6 billion shares on issue. We're going to issue another 1.1 billion shares at a discount to the market. All right, so actually, it's pretty expensive to raise money this way because you're diluting the existing holders of this company. But this is realistically what you go out and do. You market your stuff. It's at a discount to the price. And you issue these things. Now, when you get many billions of shares on issue at various points in time, you do some share consolidation. But this is really the way that you raise money for exploration in this country. So we go and do that. We've raised some money. We've, we've issued another couple of billion shares. Um, what are we doing? We're looking for gold. We're looking for gold in the Fraser Ranges, primarily. And there's some areas in here that are originally identified from geological survey work in the 1950s. So we have this library that's a resource that people can look at. We do some uh, new research. We draw on this old information. And we think we might find some gold here. It's all very uh, speculative at this stage. We don't know what's really going on. We're, we're this small company, raise a little bit of money. Fast forward uh, a little bit. What do we see? We've done a little bit of a consolidation on what's going on. We've got our expert. OK, we've now associated with Mark Creasy who is a leading gold prospector, because we're looking for gold. So we've got an expert in. We're out there promoting that in our material. So all of these are shots I've taken from uh, publicly available documents for, for this company that you can get from the ASX. OK, so it's this whole idea 
of we've got an expert, you can trust us with our money. And remember, we can't undertake exploration unless we can raise equity capital. All right, we're looking for gold and nickel. Okay, gold and nickel are found together, that's not unusual, but we're still talking about this as a gold prospect. All right, we're out there, Fraser Ranges, we're digging some holes. So here, here we have what we're doing. We're out there. We're now over in London in uh, 2010, pitching to a conference. So this is taken from the CEO's presentation to a conference in London, talking about these prospects. What do we see here? Third party certification. I'm over in London trying to drum up some money, some interest in my company. What am I emphasizing when I talk at the conference? I'm emphasizing my association with the government, my third party uh, certification mechanism. So we, we're off and we're doing things and then what happens? Da, 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 da. We found something. Okay, so here we are and they really were about to run out of money. All right, so when they say here this is the last roll of the dice, that's literally true. So here, this is the historical pictures of, of the find. Um, we made something, we have to make an ASX announcement. What's going to happen to our share price? Our share price is going to do that. <laughs> right? And, but look at the cash at bank. This company was burning half a million bucks a quarter. There is, this company is out of cash. Right? Once you get down to a million, you go into, these companies are like cockroaches, they're indestructible. You conserve cash once you hit a million dollars. They don't delist, they just sit there. This company is literally one or two quarters from going into cockroach mode, which is, it sits there and someone else uses it as a vehicle in the future. But I've got $1.7 million in cash, I'm now worth $85 million, all right? Just from that, that's, that's the day I've made a, a, an interesting discovery. So what do we do? So that's my discovery now, or well, that's something interesting, we've re reported that. Now we're going to go and dig some holes, right? We've, we've got some serious interest out here. We're going to go and dig a bunch of holes and try and prove up the resource. What's going to happen when we do that? This is actually looking, starting to look pretty good for us now. All right, we've dug, dug some more holes. You can see we've dug 90 holes now around our, our hole, and it looks like we've got some ore. What am I now worth? I've got 17 million in the bank. So the guys backing the company have rolled in some more cash. They're interested in this. What's the market cap? 600 million. All right, so I've gone from 1.7 million in the bank to 600 million in a very, very short space of time. Okay, here's our, here's our scale here, right? We've got a couple of months. All right, 1.7 million, all of a sudden I could flip this for over 600 million. <coughs> what happens next? I've got 17 million in the bank. We'll look at some costs of building this stuff, but this is a medium nickel deposit. You need more than 17 million dollars to be, even though you can get you know, mining uh, gear pretty cheap at the moment, you need a good couple of hundred million to be even thinking about getting this up. So the next step in the process is now we get to the bank. All right, up until this point, it's all equity capital. Now I fly in my bankers and I show them a good time and who knows what, convince them to give me uh, a couple of hundred million dollars. And that's really what happens, right? So that's what's happened now. Now I'm in a position where my company is worth 1.1 billion and I've got 250 million dollars in the bank, all right? So what I've been, I've been able to get the debt capital. I am now in the business of building a mine, all right? I've gone from uh, out in the bush to I actually have a genuine, this is going to be a mine at this point in time. What else do we see starting to happen? Uh, it happened a little bit earlier but about this, but here's the press. Fraser Range, who's, what's happening? My exploration activity here, I'm not going to capture all of the benefit. We have the major players coming in and taking the area in the Fraser Ranges looking for other stuff. Exactly that issue that we described, you cannot capture all of the benefits from your exploration activity, therefore you underinvest in exploration without government intervention. Yeah, uh, t t timing. I, I, there are mitigating factors. I, it's sort of this trade-off. So the bigger you make the tenements in the first place, the more you mitigate that problem. The bigger you make the tenements, the less activity you get going on in the tenements. So there's a, there's a trade-off that the government doesn't give you massive tenements 
because of that. But by not doing that, you do do this. So th there's a balance. You have to, you have to show expenditure on tax. If yeah. you don't show expenditure, you lose. So James, previously, in the previous slide, the investors in the company changed. We've got one more set. That's right. Creasy, Creasy got out. No, but also major, major, like our superannuation funds. What, we've got one, one more slide, which is the end game in this space is this. Right. Exploration activity has been outsourced to small, from big companies to small. There are lots of really good practical reasons for doing that. The end game is this, is, this is not a big nickel mine. This is actually a medium nickel mine, but it's a real nickel project sold for 1.8 billion. Now, I've done my own valuation on this company. Depending on what you assume about the nickel price, the value is either zero, or because nickel's a really interesting commodity to try and manage, or it's maybe 3.6 billion. I can come up with a valuation for this company anywhere between those two numbers, depending on, on reasonable numbers. So that's the interquartile range of the nickel price. The interquartile range of the nickel price gives you a company worth anything between zero and 3.6 billion Australian. Okay, this is crazy business to be in. I don't, I don't know why anyone gets into nickel. <laughs> but that's the game, right? You get bought out. The big guys come in. See, what's happened is Oc Health and Safety has gone crazy in the major players. It's just way too expensive for them to undertake exploration. Here, this is actually the grad student doing the geological surveys, right? How you, this is how you stretch your money. You've got back students doing your work in the field, you're out in the camp. Means you can drill a lot of metres for your money. If you're BHP, your Oc Health and Safety, the choppers in the air, blah, 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 it's hugely expensive. So what they've done is they let these guys go out and do the exploration. If they find something interesting, they come in later and buy it out. Right? If it's big, they'll buy it out. If it's really big, these, there's no way these guys would get enough money to actually develop the mine. So everyone in the industry knows that this is how it works and everyone's happy with it. Everyone, when you're successful, you'll make money. That's right. Yeah, that's there's no if you find something big you, you can't do anything with it. Right? So that's that's the end game. We went from remember we went from one point seven million in cash, so that's my real about asset, to one point eight billion in a really, real short space of time. That's real money that changes hands, right? That's no longer the market cap, that's the money that changed hands. So, there's my story, right? These things are worth, and we get royalties from that, so the government. So my story is that it's important, you can only undertake exploration if you raise equity finance in these spaces. There's a problem raising equity finance in this. It's a market for lemon, lemons problem, we resolve that. If these things get up, they're worth a lot of money, and it means that the royalty income flow is significant. So I think all those things are real. So I'm running a bit behind time. So my, my two research questions are, how much is that exploration response for the, when the government invests money, what kind of bang does it get for its buck? Uh, and then cost-benefit analysis of this, right? Is it just because there is a problem doesn't mean that the government should get involved in here. I have Two technical issues that I'll cover here. One is I have a mix of stationary and non-stationary variables in my data, and the other was just conceptually how I might think about calculating the return to government. So now I'm going to do something that I don't normally do very often in presentations. We're going to have a couple of equations, which is just interesting because I'm not sure how many people are exposed to these kinds of models. All right. Traditionally in agricultural economics, if we had something where we wanted to model the dynamics, and say that we have a slow moving process of some description or when commodity prices change, we can't change exploration expenditure immediately, there's a lag, we use a general modelling framework like this. So we have, that says, if Y is exploration expenditure in words, that says the exploration expenditure we observe today depends on the exploration expenditure we had in the past, it depends on commodity prices today, and it depends on commodity prices in the past. Right, so in words, that's, that's what it means. There are a lot of advantages to this. It gives you short run and long run effects. But all, all it means is what happened in the past is relevant for today. Right, and this is the model, a workhorse model of ag econ 
um, that developed in the 50s. Uh, really, really good model to work with. It only works when you've got stationary data, though. Okay, so what's this, what's this stationary data thing that I mean? We have this problem, if you have non-stationary data, you end up with a problem of spurious regression, which means you might make incorrect inferences about what's going on in your model. So there are lots of ways to look at um, data, so your individual data series, and decide whether or not it's stationary or non-stationary. There are a whole bunch of tests to do, to do with this. Some of you will know I'm not real big on tests, I like looking at pictures, and the classic way to decide um, whether you've got problems in your data is just to look at some patterns in the data. So I just want to describe to you what it means to have um, a non-stationary series in terms of the autocorrelations of that series. So that is, it's a time series, so these are the correlations with itself. So if you have um, something, some well-behaved data, the correlations with the, the data with itself are going to give you a pattern like this. So you're looking for a pattern in your data like this. You can do these formal tests or whatever, you can see something like this. If you have um, an autoregressive process, the pattern of correlations has this rapid decay in it. So you can see that that's a pretty sharp decay curve in my correlations with each series with its past values. If you have non-stationary data, it looks like that. All right. So people would argue that you can't distinguish between that and that. It looks pretty obvious to me. So I think you can just look at a picture and know whether or not you have these problems with your data. All right. So that's just outlining that you can have problems with your data that mean the classic way that we model things in agricultural economics doesn't work. There's a simple, simple flip of our autoregressive distributed lag model that you know, became popular in the 80s. Uh, we had the error correction model. So if you've got this problem, you've got a bunch of approaches that you could use. The first one there is about forecasting and FAN knows lots of fancier models than ARIMA models to do this. This is where you're just looking, you give up on inference and you're just about trying to predict what will happen in the future. That's one way to approach data that's non-stationary. Another way is to give up on looking at long-run effects and just look for the short-run effects. Okay, that's one thing that you can do. Sometimes that's all you can do. And the popular way that emerged was the ECM model, which is an adaption of our tra traditional model in ag econ. And what it says, it says is the first thing that says, if you take the differences of your data, they will be well behaved. So in levels, my series of expenditure on exploration is giving me some problems, but the series of the change in expenditure on exploration will be well behaved. There's also this other thing here that came out is this co-integration idea, which is simply to say that if these things will be co-integrated, if a long-run relationship exists. So if we actually think, and so in economics we can appeal to some theory, we might think that there is actually a long-run structural relationship, we can think that many of the things that we're interested in will meet this requirement of being co-integrated. So the idea of being able to take the differences and the idea of there being a long-run relationship led to the formation of the error correction model. You can do it. You can do it whichever way you want. Okay. It's it's just however your data is behaved. If you want nominal, real. Okay. So what this led to was an adaption of the the traditional agricultural economics model into a form called the error correction model. And this is simply what it is. It says that you you can't have these non-stationary variables, but it turns out we could reformulate a model that we were very familiar with in terms of only stationary variables. And from our, so there's the step, there are many ways to do this. The traditional way was to estimate the long run relationship and use the errors from that in your model down here. So this, starting in, starting in the 80s, this became a very popular model to look at. And for our purposes, it gives you a short run effect and a long run change, all right? You describe the adjustment towards equilibrium in every period. So you may or may not have seen these types of models just setting up. So that would be if you were faced with 
uh, a whole series of non-stationary uh, data, that would be the textbook solution that you would get. If you go to a textbook, that's the model that it's going to give you. There is a problem, or there is a, a wider class of problems. This only works if every series is um, first different stationary. All right. What if you have a mix? What if some variables are stationary and some are not? There is a much less popular model that solves that problem under some restrictive conditions. Now, basically it says we go to our differences and these things that are in levels that may or may not be stationary, as long as we can reject the idea that these two are zero, the coefficients of them, those are zeros, it means that we have rejected the null of the absence of a long-run relationship. And provided some technical things hold on the error terms, which is the small print, this model will solve our problem if we have a mix of stationary and non-stationary data. So my point here is that this is not very popular, it's not very seen very much, but it's a solution to a broader class of problems. And people will call this an unconstrained error correction mechanism model. Uh, can, can, uh, Pesseran and, and Shin uh, came up with this specification. There are some technical difficulties that we don't know exactly how to implement this test, but we can in practice get around them. So don't do that very often. If we're looking at time series data, there are a couple of really... Ag Econ has a lot to say about this issue. We have really good models that are not necessarily widely used, but very valuable for us to know. So there's a little bit of exposure to that and running over time, but we're now going to get on to just the, the key results. So data. So I've got price data from the LME. I've got expiration data and meters drilled from the ABS. I've got from the Department of Mines and Petroleum how much has been spent on all this stuff. I have, since 1980, every significant find, every discovery of every mineral in Western Australia. And I have detailed access to uh, production costs for, for, for the actual mines. Uh, the catch to that is it cost 11 grand. Right? So the department paid for that, so that's fine. Right? But you want this data, it's, it's there, but this is a commercial service provider and a one-year contract costs you that much. All right? But, you know, that's fine. I, mean, I didn't have to pay for it. Right. So that got my data sources, got, got some help from the government. What do I find? I find that it was quite uncertain how much of the response uh, that you get from, from, from activity that the government undertakes, but reasonably confident somewhere between for every dollar the government spends, they get an extra 5 to $30 in exploration expending that they wouldn't have otherwise got. It kind of makes sense because this is a good place to drill. Right? If you look at any of the global rankings of where you want to go looking for stuff, we're right at the top. All right? It's at the upper end of what other people have found. My characterization on that is because, well, they have a, we're basically the best place to go drilling, so it makes sense that you would get more stimulus here. How do I interpret the 5 and 30? What are they? For every $1 the government spends on geoscience, yeah. it gets between 5 and $30 of private sector spending that would not otherwise have taken place. It's 500 to 3,000%, you're saying. I'm saying it's big. And you think, so, so what you need to, so those drilling subs, so how much is a drilling subsidy you go and actively mark? 50 grand, 100 grand. How much do you raise? 5 million. It's really, it, it really tri trips, you know. Uh, so I, I didn't expect it. I actually went in genuinely sceptical about this. I actually said it's a bad idea. I actually said to the, it's a bad idea to give companies money. You are not in the business of picking winners. Basic geoscience is all you could do. That was my first conversation with them. <laughs> so I said I'm wrong at the end of that, obviously. <laughs> uh, okay, now the next bit is I'm going to say that actually, so I spoke to John Freeban about this, about what kind of penalty I should put in for raising taxes. Uh, and he's got an uh, AJ, AJ paper on this. These guys argue a lot, it's good. Uh, he's a really nice guy, he was kind enough. So I, I impose a cost. For every dollar that the government spends, the cost is $1.30. Right? That's, the, that's the cost of the government raising the money. So then I'm going to say... Deadly cost, isn't it? Yeah, m m yeah, you think of it that way. So we're going to get some... The government's going to spend some money. We're going to get 
some extra activity. So that's that's my flow through. Costs a dollar dollar thirty, you get a dollar of government spending, your dollar of geoscience spending gets you five to thirty dollars of exploration spending, and the all in cost of exploration is three hundred and sixty dollars a meter. I also know from that database how much you have to drill to find something. So that's three hundred and fifty six finds of which 116 were converted into mines. All right, so that's what it all works. So there's actually two steps in that. Finding something significant, that's what turns into something valuable. I also have, for all of my nine cases, the characteristics of the mine. So these are all based on benchmark mines that operate in Western Australia. So if you, if the, the one thing that would probably stand out in, in that is the, the grade for the gold mines. So when you get to a large mine, that's open cut the small and medium are underground. So I actually have characterized for each mineral, each size, a, a representative mine. Right? You can go in, you know, you can look them up in this uh, database. So we have all of those things. So when you find something, this is what the potential mines characteristics are. These are the three gold mines that we're going to have. How am I going to evaluate the return to the government? So what do I want to do? I'm uncertain about this private sector response. So I'm going to draw the multi what I call the multiplier for the government's investment from the distribution. I'm then going to look at how much extra um, exploration activity I get from the government spending. From that extra, extra activity, I'm going to work out the expected number. So these are going to be fractions of mines that I find. And if I find the mine, I'm then going to decide whether or not the mine proceeds. Whether or not the mine proceeds is going to depend on my price assumption. So I'm going to then draw a price from a distribution of based on the observed prices. And if the net present value of my find uh, at 12% discounted at 12% real is positive, the mine proceeds. If my significant find has net present value that doesn't meet that standard, the mine doesn't proceed. So in each run, just because I find something doesn't mean it transitions into a mine. It depends on what my price assumption is going to be. Now, if it goes ahead, I'm going to calculate the MPV for the government at discount rates between 5 and 9. All right, so for the private sector, I'm putting the, um, effectively putting the internal rate of return hurdle much higher than I put it for the government. I don't really want to get into a discussion of you know, what people think about that. I'm just going to say for the government, I have a range of values, all right, which is what I'm going to show you. So I then repeat this process 10,000 times, uh, change the discount rate for valuing it, and press play again. All right? So this spits all of this stuff out, and we get a nice distribution of results. All right? And that's, that's the key message here. What is the return to the government from royalty income and payroll tax from their investment? And you can see here, to, you, know, you can change the discount rate uh, it's, it doesn't change things too much. You um, probably want to look at the medians, median benefit cost ratio. That's a minus sign, Dave, not a hyphen, just, just for you. Um, the other thing that I think is imp or interesting about this is the space that is greater than one. All right? So what I've done is I've calculated the area under the curve via brute force, and we can work out that for my discount rate of five, 96% of the scenarios of my 10,000 draws give me a benefit cost ratio greater than one. And I think that the government can have quite confidence. It's possible that you'll get a scenario where it doesn't make sense. It's really unlikely. And I, you could be pretty confident. You're probably not going to be in the tail. But you can be pretty confident that actually your return to government is viable. Important point to note about this as well is that this would be completely different if we did this 15 years ago. Mostly what you find is small gold mines. All right? And there's another great paper in the Australian Journal from a former member of our school, Rob Fraser, that looks at the introduction of a gold royalty. If we didn't have a gold royalty, a lot of this drops out, because mainly what you find is small gold mines. All right? And that's a big chunk of the return. So that's, that's an interesting thing that I think in a policy space about royalties. You need to have a royalty on these products to get a return for government. So what, un what could generate this, unpack that, is this sort of scenario here. You have to have 
the, res the private sector response, so these are different values for the private rec sector response to a dollar's investment from the government in geoscience going across the columns, and the rows are low prices for all commodities. And the commodities don't move all together. Right? It's, it's kind of highly improbable that you would get low all... Co Gold does something different. Gold behaves in a different way to other commodities. So to get low prices for everything at the same time, and that is a really low chance. For anything like reasonable um, prices on average, you get very strong uh, outcome that the, the, the benefits or the return to government is greater than the cost. And apologies for going over. I thought I was about 35 minutes. Uh, I've gone a bit longer. Um, that's it. I was also going to say what, what this is really about. This is, um, <laughs> but again, it can't play. So if those of you that know the castle, uh, no, well, he dug a hole. Dale dug a hole. Dale dug a hole. Dale dug a hole. We're proud of you, Dale. You dug a hole. And again, for some reason, the, the, the links are not playing. So just to you know, bring it back, what's this really about? It's about digging holes. <laughs> Yeah, money out of that. Yeah. Funny money out of the bottom. Yeah, yeah. So ha happy to take. And if, if you're really interested, you can read about this in Resources Policy. Uh, the papers come out. So, so the mystery of why mines are financed, I mean, you know, I suppose you've just got deep-pocketed, risk-neutral investors for whom a 1.8 billion mine is just diversified out. So it's the superannuation funds. Yeah. So you, you, you've also got, you've got, you've got firms. So most of our miners are not interested in a 1.8 billion purchase. That's true. Like our big miners, that's not worth them worrying about. Too small. Too small. Way too small. They have like, it's got to be much bigger number for them to get interested. Start looking at you know the risk taking from the point of view of investors. Are characteristics like skewness or kurtosis become important? So so there so those are just driven by so that part is just driven by expected value. So it's it's driven by the first moment. So we don't look at the higher. So so, so that that's, I mean, that's an assumption or is it a fact? Uh, that in, in that in that decision rule that's that's an assumption. But that's that's based on a realise. It's not going to matter because it's a decision rule about whether or not you want to. So you could have a, I mean, you could make up a dis different decision rule that's the weighted, so you want to make it a weight of the higher order moments. You could do that. You could get some sort of shrinkage estimator to, to incorporate that. I don't think it really makes much difference. I think these, you know, the reality of these guys, are they thinking about that? Not really. Leveraging out five million, and you're and you're claiming that's because that the fact that the government is involved, then that's overcoming the moral hazard or yeah. the, the, the problem of lemons. Yeah, so because so, fifty thousand to these companies is peanuts. That's that's exactly right. So I, I've been and talked to these guys, and I've been through the. I, I actually in the paper I documented a case of a company running out of money, and then leveraging the statement in their capital raising. And so it seems really real to me. And it is, a, it's trivial. If it's a good prospect, they're going to drill it anyway. That's what they, they point blank say to me, we're going to drill that anyway. So it's not the money, it's the information. Yeah. The assurance. And that's the thing. If you go back into the market for Lemon's paper, this is case C. It's never brought up. And it says that the, the externality is the collapse in the market. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. And if you, if you meet these guys, it's kind, they're kind of... Rogues. <laughs> Lovable rogues, shall we say. <laughs> you know, you feel like you're going to be fleeced. They're fly by, and, you know. So, so is there a possibility then of, of a sort of form of government failure where actually you get government officials who hand out these relatively small amounts of money but don't actually go through the due, due process to work out whether the, the geology or the, 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 the scheme as a whole stacks up because they're probably overworked 
That's an ex officials of DMP. <laughs> okay, uh, do DMP see it this way? No. So if you ask them what are the criteria, their criteria might be actually it's just efficient. We've got a gap in our our sampling out here, and it's cost effective for us. If they're going to be out there, uh, if we give them 50, they need to give us a core sample, and that's helpful for us. So if you actually look at their criteria, it's got nothing to do with this. It could they say they actively say it could be to meet a, a, a knowledge gap in our base. So you could get a blue sky because it's cost effective for the department, and you can pitch that as. But doesn't that imply the information is valuable? The, the, you know, the reassurance you should get from the fact that you've got this 50 grand. That, that, that is that is what I think. I, I think that it is. I think that this is this is what's happening in the real world. Is the department understanding that's what's happening? No. Uh, are you still likely to be fleeced? Maybe. But you, you definitely, they definitely are raising money this way. Are they still fly by nights? Probably. So, so the benefit cost ratio is really uh, kind of not very promising in the you know, uh, low price, low mark prior region. The prior scenarios are you know, assumptions we, we don't have much control over. It's really the, 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 multiple, the boundary of the multiplier, that's part of the modeling is playing big here. So how confident you are with that 5 to 30 boundary? I'm pretty confident. I'm pretty confident that I'm pretty confident that that's the lower bound. Pretty confident that it goes the other way. The the prices so we set them as as the range from from the real world, but the thing is that they're not the thing is that they're not you can impose if you wanted to, like you can impose the draws so that there's structure in them. But when you when you empirically look at the data, you wouldn't want to do that. They don't behave that way. So each commodity is drawn individually because when I looked at it, it didn't make sense to impose structure on it. So I don't think that it's likely that they'd all be low at the same time. And then the two-step model, and the first step, you need to make sure that the error is a standard yeah. stationary yeah. error yeah. into the second right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah and, there are some, and, and even in that unconstrained ECM, there are some technical things like dynamic stability that you need uh, to test and... Um, some other things on the error term. It's not. It's not a. Um, it's not a magic bullet, but it's a. It's a valid alternative to what we traditionally specify as an ECM. Is that the only database? I mean, I would have thought these days some of the companies would have other sources of information to do with other probabilities of finding them when they go to market. One and two. When it went from 1.7 to 50 cents a share, that's called. Cool. Making a profit and reinvesting in the company for a <laughs> yeah, I mean that that, that yeah, they're there. I don't know what other data sources are out there. I know that there are a few commercial uh, suppliers of this kind of stuff. The one the one that I'm familiar with are these commercial SNL guys, and they charge you for access to their um, their database, and they manage that pretty tightly because they want subscriptions, not like you can't just dump everything and go, now I've got it. Like, the bigger companies, I would suggest, would have their own uh, probably, science yeah. type group inside. So when the small company says, yes, we've found something, they can yeah. have some yeah, sure. Th 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 yeah, they're in that business. Yeah. I'm interested that the, that the benefits of the whole system seem to rest on the naivety of the investors. <laughs> You know, the, the people providing the equity, they, you know, you sort of, the, the story you're told is that they are assuming that, that the government involvement in the scheme implies quality assurance, but the government isn't, doesn't quality assure it at all. I, I, I agree. And if, if you actually, if you dig down further and you look at who are the major holders in some of these equity raisings, they're not in Australia. And I, c I can genuinely imagine, so Chinese holdings, can you imagine how you could market that into a, a place where government involvement is seen as sanctioned? There, there was, so that enterprise one that I showed, that 5.1 that they raised, I went through the significant shareholder listing at the start, and about 40% of the stock was listed in Hong Kong, which I presume is mainland Chinese money 
somewhere flying through here, and I presume was completely misrepresented to them. So if they, if they offered to buy you out not to make this information public... I haven't, I haven't, I, I'm not good at taking these business opportunities. I, I just do the research. You know, the third party, insur uh, third party uh, certification, it's, it's, it has to be credible, right? And its value goes like this as your credibility goes down a bit and the whole sudden thing collapses. If your paper... Uh, so, so the reason it's credible is serious, and why it's taken serious, serious, that company that I gave you, that got the co-funding. So it's in the market that the government sponsored this within, so this pro, you know, recent history, government sponsorship, boom, it's a success. So there is definitely an association between co-funding for drilling and market success. And that, that's, that's why it, it seems, that's how you can do it. If that hadn't, if you couldn't point to, you know, the success, it wouldn't have this credibility, I think. So, in fact, you know, the, uh, whatever the, uh, the do, thing you're doing you know, doesn't matter that much in the end. Because yeah, otherwise, you'd say, okay, the impact of your paper can actually be quite big in the next year if people actually read this and say, oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan. Like, we should dig more holes here. Like, uh, <laughs> can you do a retrospective on the size of the version? <laughs> We, we, we do lose money from time to time. Nickel, right? This is all nickel. Always nickel. Yeah.